This morning as we have come together in the name of the Lord Jesus in this place that you've so graciously and generously provided for us, we thank you for the old hymns of the faith we can sing that Father express uh, in words that we could not pen uh, our very sentiments and love for you. We thank you for the opportunity to pray and know that you hear our prayers and thank you for being a prayer hearing God and a prayer answering God. Thank you, my Father, for the opportunity to give of our substance, of that which you have given to us. We give back a portion in our faith and in honor and glory to you. And now, my Father, as we look into the Word of God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would enable thy servant to speak and enable everyone in this room, everyone who's listening on live stream and everyone who's watching, that, Father, everyone who's tuned into the radio station would hear the Word of God and it would be a blessing and a help to them. I pray, my Father, that you might glorify yourself, magnify your Son, edify your people, and save the lost. And we'll thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. To begin, let's look over at Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The remarkable truth that is set forth here is that God himself is at work in every truly born-again, blood-bought believer to accomplish his will in and through them and to do his own good pleasure in and through you. Another verse, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, if you'd like to turn a page. The Bible says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Again, God once more is confirming to us that he is the one who's begun the good work. He is the one that is working in us. He is the one that will perform it. And he is the one who will keep performing it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has set forth to fully accomplish this work that has begun when you became a child of God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. One more, Romans 8, 29, the Bible says that God predestinated that we be conformed to the image of His Son. Amen. In other words, the moment you got saved, God began the work of conforming you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ to make you more and more like Him until one day when we finally get to heaven, we will be just like Him. Amen. My friends, that's the greatest work that could ever be begun in a person's life. It's the greatest work that God can do besides winning you to Christ is conforming you to His image. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. One of these days, we're going to, in a blink of an eye, be made just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, don't get me wrong. We will not be Jesus Christ. But we will be like Jesus Christ. We will be conformed to His image. And so the entire New Testament is the instruction manual on how to work with God in order to advance and expedite this confirmation. One such passage we find in the book of Philippians. And so let's see the challenge that God lays down for His children in this passage. Number one, we want to look at the proposal in verses 1 through 4. Now I'll make no mistake about it, this is a difficult challenge. God is going to challenge His church in verses 1 through 4. And it's possible only by the resources that are found in verse 1, and that is the resource of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of the living God. Now the Holy Spirit's proposal penned by the Apostle Paul is found beginning in verse 2, where the Bible says, Fulfill ye my joy, here it is, that ye be like-minded. The church members of Philippi were to be like-minded. This is the word, the two words, 
autos phreneo. It means mentally disposed. It means interested in. It means sets the affections on. It means to think. In other words, he's saying he wants the believers at Philippi and the believers at Grace of Calvary in Erie, Pennsylvania to think alike and be mentally disposed to and interested in and set our affections on the same thing. We're in this together. We're a body of believers. And Paul said, we ought to be like-minded. The second thing he says is we're to love one another. John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now I want you to think about this just for a moment. If the Lord treated you like you treat your brother or sister in Christ, Could you call that love? If the Lord had the same thoughts and feelings in His heart that you have about others in your heart, would you call that love? And yet the Bible tells us we're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to have the same love. I'm supposed to have the same love that Jesus had for me, for you, and you're supposed to have the same love that Jesus had for you, for me. I told you it was challenging, didn't I? Number three, the Bible says here we're supposed to be of one accord and one mind. These words are talking about the sentiments and the thoughts. In other words, we are to think biblically. We're supposed to have the same mind, folks. We're supposed to think biblically together. And we're supposed to operate biblically together. And we're supposed to interrelate one another biblically together. How? Having the same mind. And we're to be of one accord. Our sentiments, our attitudes ought to be very, very similar. Because we're thinking biblically. And he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. The word strife here is the word erethria. It means factions and contentions. There ought not to be factions in the local church. There ought not to be contentions among the brothers and among the sisters. The word vainglory simply means self-conceit, empty glory. Glory that is really uh, brought about by ourselves. A glory that comes because of our desiring of glory and and, uh, going after glory. It's really an empty glory. He's saying you don't do the things you do just so everybody will think you're great. You don't act the way you act so that everybody will pat you on the back and think you're spiritual. That's vain glory. He says we ought not to strive and have factions and contentions. We ought not to be going about after self-conceited glory. And then he says this, that we ought to have a lowliness of mind. Simply put, it's humility. A lowliness of mind. And then we're to esteem others. Look what it says. Having a lowliness of mind. Now you're not going to be able to do the next thing unless you have this lowliness of mind. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. The practice of humility is the opposite of the modern philosophy and human nature. Isn't it? Practicing humility. You see, lowliness of mind is humility, and then esteeming others as greater than ourselves is the practice of that humility. But it's the opposite of the human nature. It's the opposite of the modern philosophy. The modern philosophy is me, my, and mine first. Amen? The modern philosophy is to put ourselves up. And often we put ourselves up by putting others down. These are things that are contrary to our sinful human nature. We naturally think evil of others while thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We naturally want our own way, which causes strife as we seek our own glory. Add to this that we live in a a world that's all about self-esteem. But remember verse 1. 
If therefore there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, look over at verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. We can't lose sight of the fact that Paul referred to the operation of Christ in you as the means of accomplishment of the proposal that Paul gives in verses 1 through 4. Are you with me? When we read verses 1 through 4, we say, how can we do that? Verse 1 tells us and verse 3 tells us. The church of the redeemed should not be like other hu human organizations. I told the Sunday school class this morning, we're not an organization, we are an organism. We are a living, breathing organism. We are a local church. We are part of the body of Christ. We are alive in Christ. We're not like organizations that humans come up with. Our foundation is different. It's Jesus Christ. Our charter is unique and our mission is spiritual. When a church experiences infighting and backbiting and person sliding, it is the operation of a worldly organism, not the living organism of the body of Christ. Other organizations, look, we can't operate like a Fortune 500 company. When we do, it exhibits respective persons and loses its focus and becomes more conformed to the world than to Christ. Sometimes the church will make sure its board has all the businessmen in town on. Well, you know, they may be great businessmen, but the church is supposed to walk by what? Faith and not by sight. Most businessmen I know walk by sight. You don't run a church by sight. You run a church by what? By faith. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The only way that a church can operate on the level of Paul's proposal brings me to point number two, the power. Look at verse five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now this is the mind that God's trying to form in each one of us. Remember, He began, began a good work in you. Remember, He's conforming you to the image of Christ. God wants to form in you and form in me the mind of Jesus Christ. He wants us to think like Jesus. He wants us to think according to the Word of God. He wants us to think biblically. He wants us to approach our life thinking biblically, approach our job thinking biblically, approach our education thinking biblically, approach our relationships in the community and in our families thinking biblically. He wants us to have a different mind than we had when we first came to Him. Amen. And this is the renewing of the mind. We're supposed to let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, God wants to teach us and train us to think like the Lord and not like our sinful selves or carnal humanity. In order for the church to be what it's supposed to be, the individuals who make up the church need to be what they need to be. And it begins with thinking. Grace of Calvary is not what I make it to be. It's what you make it to be. It's not what I am, it's what you are collectively. You are the church. And our thinking begins with one little word in verse 5. This little word, let. Now let means to allow, and to allow supposes cooperation. Right? Hey, would you let me have that? Well, what does that require? That requires for you to make a choice, and it requires for you to cooperate and let me have it. That word let means to allow, and to allow supposes to cooperate. Who are we cooperating with? With God. Who's working in you? God. Who's conforming you to the image of Christ? So who are we going to cooperate with? God. 
God's saying, let this mind be in you. We should say, okay, working on it. I think sometimes we're afraid to let the mind of Christ be formed in us. Because we like our own mind too much. We have words like, well, I'll make up my own mind. Oh, I've got my own mind. Nobody's going to tell me what to think. Nobody tells me what to do. Blah, 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 blah. It's all about you. God says, let this mind, not your mind, let this mind. Which mind? The, my, my, the mind of Christ, let this mind be in you. Allow God to have your mind. Allow God to conform your mind. Allow God to work in your mind. Which is part of that good work that He has begun in you at salvation. Now Romans 8, 6 says this. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In other words... Well, that, that phrase carnal mind is, is uh, sark, sark from ama. It means this, natural human mind. So the natural human mind is death. But the spiritual mind is life. Your mind, your natural human sinful mind is death. But the mind of Christ the spiritual mind is life. You know what God's saying? He's saying, let me take death out of your head and put life in. You say, what do you mean the, the carnal mind is death? The wages of sin is what? Death. And you have a sinful mind. And so the things that your sinful mind come up with will lead to death. Romans 8, 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity with God, against God. In other words, he says, you know that mind you had when you, when you came to me? You know that unsaved, unregenerate human mind that you came to me with? Well, it was an enmity with me. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, because his mind had no enmity with God. You understand what God's saying here? It's something we got to do. It's something we have to allow. So basically, we need to allow the thinking of Christ to rule our minds, not our own stinking thinking. Or, in other words, that which we have learned and adopted from the world. The world has its whole way of thinking. And as, the longer we were in it, the more of it we had. And, and he's saying, I don't want you to think like the world. I want you to think like Jesus. Now, what kind of mind did Christ have? Well, verses 5 through 8 tell us it was a humble mind. A mind of humility. Look at verse 6. This is the mind that was in Jesus. The one he wants to be in you. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Bible says that Jesus being found in the form of God. When was that? That was before he was ever incarnate. When you go back before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when you go back before Adam and Eve went in the garden, when you go back before the world was without form and void, when you go back before there was ever anything else existing except God himself, Jesus was there and Jesus is God. He wasn't like God. He is in the form of God. And then it says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now listen, no one can be equal with God except God. Right? The Bible says there's one God. So if there's one God, there can't be anybody equal to him except God. You following me? You see, God exists on a plane all his own. He's in a league all by himself. 
God is a being, and there's no other being that bees like God. And Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, if Jesus thought he was equal with God, and only God can be equal with God, then Jesus thought he was who? God. God. And if Jesus wasn't God, then he's deluded, deceived, and he is no savior. Do you see the importance of that verse? He was in the form of God, meaning he was God. He didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God because he was equal with God because he's God. See his humility as I read for you Luke twenty two forty two, where he prays, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You see the humility of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we don't get our way, we get mad at God. We tell God the way we want it to go down, and it don't go down that way, we get angry at God. We tell God how we want it to happen. We tell God what we want to do. We tell God what we want Him to do. And when it doesn't work out all that way, we get angry at God. But here's God talking to God. You say, how does that work? The Bible says, the Lord said unto my Lord. You see, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. you got one God in three persons. You say, how does that work? Like what? Tell me what it's like. Come on. It's like an egg, amen? And for those of you that are visiting today, this is how I explain God. We have a hard-boiled egg. You can have a hard-boiled egg, soft-boiled egg, any kind of egg, just get an egg. Egg has how many parts to it? How many eggs? Hmm. Now, if I put the shell over on that side of the church, and I put the yellow in the middle of the church, and I put the white over on that side of the church, how many parts do I have? How many eggs do I have? Now, is the white any, any less part, any, any, uh, is the white any less egg than the yellow? Is the yellow any less egg than the white? They're all equal, but they're only one egg. Isn't God good? He gave us something. He said, I'm, you know, I'm going to teach those people about me. I'm going I'm to give them an egg. That's how simple we are. We've got to have an egg. We can't figure it out any other way, man. So people that don't believe Jesus is God, they lay an egg, amen? (laughs) But you know, here's here's God, the Son, talking to God the Father, and what is He saying? He's saying to the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What cup? The cross. He's saying, if it be possible... In other words, if there's any other way, if there's any possible way for people to have their sins forgiven and be saved, besides me going to the cross, let's do that. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And you know what the Father said to the Son? The Father said, there's no other way. It's not possible, Son. He said, there's no way we can save fallen mankind. There's no way we can get people from the road to hell to heaven. There's no other possible way for them to be saved but for you to go through this. And Jesus didn't get angry at God. Jesus said, well, that's not what I want to do. No, 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 no. No, he just said, okay. You say, why would Jesus even ask the Father if it's possible, let it pass from me? Because that's why he came. Let me say this. Think about this just for a second. Jesus wasn't concerned about the agony. Jesus wasn't concerned about the humiliation. Jesus wasn't concerned about the degradation. You know what Jesus was concerned about? The Bible said he became sin for us. That's what he shrank from. He who is sinless and perfect. He who is holy and righteous altogether. He was going to become sin. I can't even wrap my head around that. But that was the reality. That he who was sinless would now become sin. 
that God, the Bible says, would lay on him the iniquity of us all. And I want to say, friends, you look around this world and there's a pile of sin. I mean dirty, dark, stinking, rotten sin. It was laid on him. He became sin. The Bible says he bare our sins in his own body. That's what, that's what he was, listen, that's what he was shrinking from. But even that, he was willing to do sort of a scoundrel like you Amen. and me could be saved. That's the mind of Christ. That's the mind of humility. Jesus was equal with God, is God, and yet humbled himself. And make no mistake about it, Jesus Christ is the eternal God. And in verse 7, look at the word. Here he is, the eternal God, the creator of the universe, the glorious one. But, but, made himself of no reputation. You know, we're all about reputations, aren't we? You know, the president is all about his reputation. He wants to build a legacy for himself. And every president wants to build a legacy for themselves. We're all concerned about having a big reputation, a great reputation. Listen, it was a humbling and humiliating experience for the God of creation to become like one of his creatures. Amen. It says here, he, took up, he, he made himself of no reputation. It was condescension and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That the sinless God should take on the form of sinful man. And though without sin, have to walk on human feet and touch things with human hands and subject himself to things like hunger and thirst. That he would have to walk on dirt and shake the hands that would nail him to the cross and heal the people who would yell, crucify him, crucify him that he would be confined for the only time in all eternity to a human body. But this is he was willing to do. This he humbled himself to do. Do you understand? It was a humbling for Jesus to become a man. Humbling beyond any humiliation you can ever experience. Because we don't have the capacity to experience the humiliation and degradation that he experienced becoming one of us. This is the mind, he says. Let this mind be in you. Paul says in Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Let me ask you, what's beneath you, Christian? What's beneath you? What could God ask you to do that's beneath you? Let me ask you, what are you too proud to do? Where are you too proud to go? And why are you so proud? 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, For whom maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as, thou, as if thou hadst not received it? What's God saying? He's saying, he, name one thing. Name one thing you have that you didn't receive. Can anybody? Nope. There's not one thing you have. There's not one thing you are that you have not received. He said, so why do you glory like you didn't receive it? Why do you walk around in your pride and pomp and circumstances if it's from you and you made yourself the way you are? You see the depth and the arrogance of human pride? Who is it that you will not talk to? Who is it that you will not forgive? Who is it that you will not love? Who is it that you think is beneath you?
He who is Lord of all became a servant, it says here. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. The Lord of all became the servant. You know, some of great reputation and standing are unwilling to become a servant. And why? The fear of tarnishing their reputation. Oh, they wouldn't be seen doing that. Oh, they wouldn't be caught dead doing that. Why? Because it would tarnish my reputation. Jesus made himself of no reputation. So to maintain a reputation before men, sometimes Christians ruin their reputation before God Almighty. And that illustrates the absurdity of human reasoning. That's the old mind, right? The old mind says, well, what do people think? The mind of Christ says, what does my Father in heaven think? Our mind says, well, what do people say? The mind of Christ is, what does the Father say? He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. All the suffering that he went through was part of his humiliation. So the mind of Christ was a humble mind, but secondly, in verse 8, it was an obedient mind. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became what? Say it to me. A what? Obedient. Unto what? Death. He whose life became obedient to death. Death had no claim on him. Death had no power over him. Yet he was willing to humbly submit to it. Not for himself, but for you and for me. And not only was he willing. Listen, he is life. He is the creator of life. He is eternal life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And yet he was willing to submit himself and humble himself to death. But not just death. The Bible says here, the cross. Even, the Bible says, even the death of the cross. One of the most painful and torturous forms of public execution mankind has ever devised is the cross. On that cross, the Bible says, He bore our sins. And this, accompanied with the fact that He is God, uniquely qualifies Him to be our substitute and our only Savior. All right? Who is Jesus? He's God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. And He is the only one that is uniquely qualified to take our place on the cross and pay for our sin because He alone is sinless and perfect. No one else died on the cross. No one else was buried and rose again from the dead. Not Mary, no preacher, no prophet, no pope. Only Jesus. Did you hear what I said? Only Jesus. If you want to believe on someone or something else, go right ahead and be lost for eternity. If you want to pray to someone else or something else, go right ahead and be doomed for all the rest of time in the lake of fire. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. You know why? Because neither is there salvation in, listen to me, any other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's why. He didn't need any help. Matter of fact, he did not even accept any help. Remember when he was dying on the cross, they offered him a sponge mingled with gall. You know what that was to do? It was help take away the pain. Kind of like a morphine shot today. And Jesus said, I'm not going to let you do it. I don't need any help. While dying on that cross, he didn't need any help. From rising from the dead, he didn't need any help. 
To forgive your sins, he doesn't need any help. To save your soul, he doesn't need any, any help. He doesn't need help from the saints, and he doesn't need help from the ain'ts. And he doesn't need help from your pitiful little works and paltry rituals that you think can earn some measure of forgiveness or eternal life. If you think there's anything you can do or anything you have to do to work your way to heaven or you have to do some kind of ritual to get to heaven, my dear friend, Jesus doesn't need your help. He needs your faith. He wants you to believe on Him and trust Him as your Savior. Don't hang on to yourself or someone else. You've got to let go and grab hold of Jesus. I want to tell you what it's like. You're out in the, you're out in the bay and you're, you don't know how to swim and you're drowning. And somebody, somebody throws you a cinder block and says, Here, here's uh, some rituals. Hold on to these. And somebody else throws you a, 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 a big, great big old uh, ship anchor and says, here's good works, hold on to that. And someone throws you a nice pres life preserver and says, here's Jesus, hold on to that. Amen. I want to tell you what, you better let go of those other things and grab hold of that Jesus or you're going down. You understand? You can't help. Jesus doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your help to get saved. Hey, he doesn't need your help to keep you saved. All the sufferings and work that needed to be done for salvation was done by the Lord Jesus on the cross and he clearly said, it is finished. Dare you try to add to that? It's an insult to God. Sinner, all God wants you to do is obey the gospel of Christ and put your faith in him and him alone, him alone, him alone for the salvation of your soul. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Dear Christian, this is the mind that will give you victory and enable you to expedite the work of God in you. A humble mind and an obedient mind. And so we see the proposal that Paul gives in verses 1 through 4. They say, we can't do that. He says, yeah, I know. That's why you have to let the mind of Christ be in you. An obedient mind. A humble mind. And then will come the precipitate. Verses 9 through 11. That word precipitate simply means result. Look at the result of Jesus' mind of humility and obedience. Look at verse 9. Wherefore, because Jesus had this mind and did what he did because he had that mind, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the result. I want you to understand there's no other name. And that every human being that ever traversed planet Earth will kneel before the Lord Jesus Christ and will confess that Jesus is Lord. Now I said every human being of every faith and every cult and every ism and every humanistic train of thought and every philosophy and every culture and every country and every race, every knee shall bow. And every tongue, every human tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Isn't that great? I don't care what they're saying now. I don't care what they're, what they're hollering now. It don't matter. Because one day they're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That word Lord means God. He is who he says he is. What did Paul say to the voice that he heard on the Damascus Road? Now, he said, who art thou, Lord? Now who would Paul call Lord? Only Jehovah God. Paul is a Pharisee. Paul is, you know, he, he's Mr. Religion. He's a Jew. 
They have one Lord and one God, and His name is Jehovah. So, in fact, what, what Paul's saying is, Who art thou, Jehovah God? And the voice who Paul knew was Jehovah God said, I am Jesus. I don't know about you, but that... I just had some hairs hang out on the back of my neck going, woo Because I would never do that. There's only one Lord, and He is Jesus. And every tongue will confess. You, my friend, will bow your knee if you haven't already. And you will confess if you haven't already that Jesus is Lord. Now, the only difference is if you do it on this side of the grave, He'll forgive your sins and save your soul. But if you do it on that side of the grave, He won't help you out. Why? Because that's who He is. And you have to... We're saved by grace through what? Faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. Here, you bow the knee and confess with the tongue by faith. There, you'll do it by sight. You don't get saved by sight. Isn't that exciting? Amen. So my dear friend, if you're here today and you haven't been saved, if I were you, I'd bow the knee and I'd confess with my tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord now before it's too late to receive eternal life. When we let the mind of Christ be formed in us, then we will see the results of verse 15. And we're almost done. That ye, let this mind be in you, that ye. So if you don't let this mind be in you, then you won't. So let this mind be in you, verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. When we're functioning on the operating system which the world has installed into our brains, we do not shine, we only blend in. But when we function on the operating system that God has installed, we will shine as lights in the world. We'll be doing what is mentioned in verse 16, holding forth the word of life. This, this, this is the word of life, the Bible. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's not the government's opinion or the bureaucrat's opinion or the politico's opinion that counts is what the Bible says, what the word of God says. That's what counts. This is what we're supposed to hold forth. And we're supposed to hold it forth shining. Shining. But we ain't shining. If we're not, we don't have the mind of Christ, we're just blending in. And I'm afraid, my friends, that too much of Christianity today is blending in. They're blending in. This Bible is your authority. This is the inspired and errant and fallible and immutable Word of God. Only when we allow the mind of Christ to be in us will the church be able to carry out the proposal of verses 2 and 4 and see the precipitate of verse 15. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. My oh my, what a challenge. What a proposal that Paul gives in verses 1 through 4. And what a powerful thing we find in verse 5 of letting this mind be in you. Maybe tonight, maybe today, dear Christian, dear born again one, you realize that there's too much of the old operating system left over. You're thinking too much with your brain, or your mind, I should say, than his mind. The world's mind than his mind. And maybe today you realize you need to think more biblically. And in order to think more biblically, you need to know more Bible. Maybe today you should come before the Lord of, uh, of heaven and say, Lord, I want you to conform in me the mind of Christ. I want to be more like him, not less. And I want to shine forth, not blend in. Oh God, help my life to count. Help me to have the mind of Christ. And maybe you're here today and you've never been saved. You've never been born again. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you're not born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. 
And the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The only way to be born of God is to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ alone as your Savior. To call upon him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Being born again isn't working toward it. It's not doing any ritual to do it. It's receiving the free gift of eternal life by receiving Christ as your Savior. And maybe right where you sit, you know in your heart of hearts that you've never been born again. But you also know you want to be born again. And you'd like to be born again. And the good news is you can be born again right where you sit. You say, preacher, I'd like to be born again. And I'll help you. We can pray together and you can pray a prayer of faith, trusting Christ as your Savior and asking Him to be your Savior. And I'll help you with it if you want me to. Say, preacher, I want to be born again. I want to be saved. I want to do it now. I'll pray with you. I want you to look up at me if that's what you want to do. You say, preacher, I'm ready to be saved. I'm willing to be saved. I want to be saved right now and I'm not going to wait any longer. I want to pray and trust Christ as my Savior right here in my seat before it's eternally too late. Anybody like that here in this room today? Heavenly Father, there's a great room of Christians here. And to the extent that we shine, and to the extent that we're peculiar, to the extent that, my Father, we are a holy nation and a royal priesthood, to the extent that we're ambassadors for Christ, instead of blending in and being invisible, to that extent, will affect those around us. I pray you'd help us to think with the mind of Christ. To have a mind that's humble and a mind that's obedient. Help us, my Father, please. And then I pray, dear Lord, if there is someone here who for one reason or another isn't saved, but it's kind of reluctant, I pray you'd help them to get over that. I pray you'd, by your Holy Spirit, move them to understand they need Jesus and come and meet me at the front let us help them with it. And Father, if there's anybody watching or listening that does not know Christ as Savior, help them to confess their sin to Him and to confess that they believe that He is who He says He is and that He did what the Bible says He did and they'll trust Him as their Savior. I pray you'd bless the invitation, my Father. Glorify yourself. We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn. Number 540, 540 in your Bibles. And maybe this morning you've seen a little something of Jesus that you've lost sight of. Maybe you recognize something that Jesus did for you or how much he loves you and you want to come and thank him and praise him. Maybe you'd like to just come and get on your face before God and say, Oh God, thank you for coming from heaven to earth so that I could go to heaven, not to hell. Maybe you'd like to come this morning and say, Lord, here am I. I need you to work on my mind. I want the mind of Christ. I want more of the mind of Christ than than the mind of the world. I want you to work that work in me. Keep working that work in me. Maybe you want to come and just say, Lord, I want to cooperate with you. I I don't want to be resistant or reluctant any longer. Help me to have a soft heart and a ready mind. Maybe this morning you just know you need to get saved. If you need to get saved, you come and see me, all right? We'll help you as we sing on the first. Almost persuaded now to convenient time to surrender is there something really that's more important in your life right now than being obedient to Lord Jesus something right now that has greater sway with you than being humble like the Lord what is it you won't do 
Where is it you won't go? Who is it you won't shake hands with? Who is it you won't minister to? That's your mind, not his. Why don't you come and say, Lord, forgive me. I put my mind ahead of yours. I've reluctantly and stubbornly held on to my thinking rather than letting you think through me. If you need to be saved, you come and see me. We're going to sing that second stanza. Almost persuaded, come, come today. Almost persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here, angels are leaving. so dear oh wanderer come almost persuaded harvest is past almost persuaded doom comes at last oh cannot avail almost is but to bear sad sad that bitter way almost but lost all right i just remembered one thing before we go we were supposed to have a baptism today but the individual who was going to be baptized couldn't come so the baptistry is full the baptistry is ready. What about you? Have you been saved? Have you been born again, but you've never, be, never been scripturally baptized by immersion? There's only one Bible method of baptism, and it is being put under the water, showing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. You've never made that public confession in baptism. You've never followed the Lord in obedience. The Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them. You've never done that. Why don't you do it now? And you know, we're not even going to sing a song. If you're here this morning and you know you're supposed to get baptized, don't put it off any longer. You come on right up right now. Step out of your seat. We've got everything we need back there in the changing rooms. We'll baptize you right now. Anybody like that here today? Put your hand up and say, yes, preacher, I'm here, I'm, not, I'm saved, I'm not baptized, I'm ready. I'll do it. Amen. All right, come on up here. Amen. Well, he's getting baptized. Was he supposed to get baptized today? You gave me a permission slip, didn't you? All right. <laughs> forgot about you, brother. <laughs> you forgot too? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Who else? Anybody else? Okay, you're all on your own, me and you.